Holy Ghost inside of me is calling out for mega power, for mega grace. Come on, shout now to the Lord. I can bend my leg. I can get on my knees. Yeah. You, Jesus, I love what you've done for me. Amen. Amen. Come on. All right, uh, let's kind of pick back up again here uh, where we left off before about the revival there that was breaking out in 1901 in Topeka, Kansas. And so there's several things that we can learn from it. And we wrote an entire book about it. Uh, this is not a commercial, but it'll just really help you and stir your faith. And there's some photos in here that were given us that really are not in any other revival book in the world. And so if you're interested, you can get it and uh, um, you can get whether an e-copy or you can get a hard copy right on our website, sharethefire.org. There's all kinds of free downloads on there, or some other revival resources. Uh, so I really encourage you go there. Uh, you can go to Amazon, but you can't get any of the free resources there. And so that's why we always encourage everybody, hey, listen, go over to uh, sharethefire.org. It's just easier for you. You can get the ebook as well as on top of it, you can get some of the other free resources as well. Okay, so in this revival of 1901, what we see is this crazy man by the name of Charles Parham. And Charles Parham, obviously having his own issues, <laughs> uh, that's probably an understatement to some people, but Charles Parham was uh, just phenomenally hungry for God. And so just in a brief recap, he went and he started a Bible school in the middle of America in a place called Topeka, Kansas. And so in Topeka, Kansas, he started this Bible, Bible school that he didn't advertise, that you know, didn't advertise anywhere, nothing, just went and said, the hungry will find out from God. <clears throat> and that's, that's kind of how he handled it. And so what he did was he went and started this Bible school in uh, the fall of about September, October-ish of 1901. And so as he started this Bible school, the main subject was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he'd have the students pray for the sick children that lived in the orphanage right next door. And I, I've been to the very spot uh, where the uh, uh, Stone's Folly is. And, and not only that, but I've been to the very, very spot where uh, uh, even where the, the orphanage was. Now it's a Catholic church that's there and stuff like that. But, but it's amazing. You can still see where it all began in the middle of really nowhere. And so, um, but it's uh, awesome to see the Holy Spirit go into this, use these people in that place. And these 44 people travel south and they begin to get people baptized in the Holy Spirit wherever they were. And so they stop in Tulsa. They get people born again and baptized in the Holy Ghost and healed down there. The same thing happens in Dallas. And then they kind of work their way down as kind of time allots it because they're fighting the elements and, you know, they're fighting various other things and they're trying to trying to get their way to uh, all the way to San Antonio, Texas, which is quite a ways. It's probably uh, in miles, I would say conservatively about 1800 miles. Uh, thereabouts, about 1,800 miles. Well, it's probably closer to 1,500 miles. So about 1,500 miles they have to travel. And, you know, I mean, you're talking not with, you know, modern highways. You're talking with horse and buggy primarily, okay? <clears throat> so as they get down there, they work their way all the way down to South Texas. Now, in the meantime, they're picking up disciples and people's, people along the way that are getting impacted by the Holy Spirit, saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, healed. Some are getting demons cast out of them. Incredible stuff going on. And so as they're working their way down there, they get down there to South Texas. They start this Bible school. And so as they start this Bible school, um, they had all these people that had come from everywhere to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, Parham was doing these teachings. Now, this was in the height of our American uh, segregation. And so the blacks and the whites, it just wouldn't allow the integration for meetings or anything like that. 
And Parham was kind of a stickler to, to obey those rules and laws, those Jim Crow laws. And so uh, Parham went and was approached by a man uh, that's one of the other characters in this book by the name of William Seymour. And William Seymour was uh, a man of God from Louisiana. And so he had come a long ways. He had probably come at least 500 to 700 miles to come to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And so, uh, but because of these Jim Crow laws of segregation, um, Charles Parham went and said, you can't sit in the class with us, but you can sit outside the classroom. So he literally sat outside the classroom and would put his ear up to the keyhole or he could look through the keyhole or he could peek through the window, but he could never be in the classroom, but he could hear it. And uh, as he began to hear it, the hunger inside of him was bigger than, than you know, offenses of, of, you know, whatever, you know, the prejudice of some. It was like Seymour, to me, probably had one of the best characters and, and integrity and just incredible spiritual integrity and spiritual character of any of the men and women of God that I've studied. It's just really amazing. And, and he had a, a full beard because when he was a kid, he had scarlet fever and he got real wicked scars on his face from it. So he was very self-conscious about it. Plus he lost the sight in his one eye uh, from the disease. So he as well had been healed and, and you know, wanted to minister to the sick in power. And so he wanted this baptism of power from an on, on high. And so Seymour went there with kind of that thought process and said, you know what, I, I want this. No matter what it takes, I'm going to go there. And so here he is. Uh, he hears about it, in fact, to the point that Seam uh, excuse me, uh, Parham really liked Seymour. I mean, they were really good friends. And Parham went and said to him, listen, I'm going to go to a particular area and I'm going to hold some meetings there uh, for the white people if you'll minister at the same time to the black people. And so what they did was they would, you know, rent a hall and they would literally have one side split off from the other and Seymour would teach on the baptism as Parham exactly what he had learned from Parham. But now mind you, exactly like Parham, Seymour never had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He had just heard about it, saw it in the Word of God, preached it from the Word of God, preached it as well, not just from the Word, but from church history as well as from people's testimonies. And as he began to preach like that, people started to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit in both camps, okay? And I mean, tell me, God's not merciful. I mean, it's just amazing. And so in the midst of this, the Holy Ghost is just being poured out just like a mighty river of God's fire, God's fiery love to all of humanity. And so people are just being blessed and healed and filled and impacted by the glory of God. And so much so that... Uh, word is getting out everywhere. Well, in the midst of this, this is about 1905-ish, uh, end of 1905, early 1906, word gets to Seymour as he's doing these meetings that somebody's interested in him um, ministering in Los Angeles, but actually taking over a church as a senior pastor. So Seymour says, I'm doing it. I'm, I mean, I have nothing holding me here. I'm just going to go for it. And so Seymour went and boarded a train and literally left with not much more than just clothes on his back and went all the way to Los Angeles. Well, from San Antonio to Los Angeles, that's almost 2,000 plus miles. I mean, it's a long train ride. So it probably took several days, if not even a week. So Seymour's exhausted, but he's been reading in the train about the baptism of the Holy Spirit in his Bible, and he's been getting blessed and getting excited and stuff like that for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, and he's hungry for God. So he gets there to this place called Los Angeles, and he gets to this church, and as he does, he ministers in this church on a Sunday morning. And what does he preach on? baptism of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and so he thought these people were really hungry for it. He had no idea he was walking into a church mess. 
And so Seymour's like, woohoo, that was powerful. People were blessed, you know, and people are stirred up and fired up. And so Seymour said, come back tonight to the night service, Sunday night service, and we will just go for it. And people are going to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Well, Seymour goes to somebody's home to get a meal. He comes back to the church that evening before service to pray. And as he gets to the church, he sees the church is padlocked. And the, <laughs> the leaders had had a meeting and they didn't want this controversial tongues thing in the church. And so they just, in a, they thought it was being nice to see more is we'll just lock him out. <laughs> Even though he's moved himself across the country and moved here over 2,000 miles, we'll just lock him out and somehow he'll just have to deal with it. Well, Seymour was devastated by this, as were the people of the church. But there was this lady that lived not too far away, and her name was Bonnie Bray, and so she said, come to my home, and we'll just have the meeting there. Well, it was a small home. It was not a large home. I've been to the home. It's very small. Uh, I mean, the living room area, maximum capacity is maybe 10, 12 people could fit in there. Well, I mean, Seymour went and came with, uh, you know, quite a few people. And so several people came there to that meeting, much more than 10 or 12. And Seymour began to preach on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And this one was speaking in tongues and that one's prophesying. And the next one is interpreting. And then somebody else is falling and under the power and somebody's having a vision. And, and it was just unbelievable what God was doing. It was incredible outpouring of the spirit. I mean, it was amazing to see God's hand just move in such power like that. And so what happened was in the midst of that, a woman jumped up speaking in tongues, twirling around sat down on a piano that was in the house and began to play like a classic pianist. She had never had a lesson in her life. That woman would end up becoming William Seymour's wife. But at the time, they didn't even know each other and stuff like that. But that's how she got the baptism of the Spirit. In these meetings at the Bonnie Bray house, um, Seymour got the baptism of the Holy Ghost himself. And as he began to do so, uh, he began to preach with more fervency. More people started coming to the point where people would sit literally outside the house. They would open all the windows and literally sit on the porch to listen to Seymour preach. And then they would just sing a cappella or they would sing with the piano. And so finally someone found that there was a, uh, an old barn stable so to speak, right there on Azusa Street, which is kind of just kitty corner, just kind of right off from where the Bonnie Bray house is. Not on the same street, but it's just kind of off to the side. And so someone found out that they could have meetings there. I mean, it was just tin. I mean, it was nothing to write home about. It was not geared for a church service, nothing. And so they had no money. They had sawdust floors. And not only sawdust floors, but they, the, the podium that he used was two or three chicken coops all stacked up on top of each other. And he just put his Bible, just placed his Bible up on top of there. And that's what he preached off of, <laughs> were these chicken coops. And the glory of God would fall and hit that place. There were reports actually that, uh, and you have to understand back in those days, you didn't show public emotion. That was a really a no-no. It was a bad thing to show public emotion. And I mean, these people are showing incredible public emotion to the point where Seymour would get up to go preach. And as he would start preaching from the word of God, <laughs> um, Seymour would get hit with the joy of the Lord and he would start laughing uncontrollably to the point where he would put his head in that chicken coop and just laugh in the chicken coop uncontrollably, drunk in the Holy Ghost. And so all of these things are from way back in, in, uh, in Azusa Street. Let, let me just give you a great testimony. Back in 2003, we ministered in uh, uh, um, a country called Puerto Rico, which is just off the coast of the U.S. And we ministered in Puerto Rico. And as we ministered in Puerto Rico, people came from everywhere. 
Um, and we, we ministered in one very religious church that really just kind of quenched the Holy Spirit. But then we went across the island about three and a half uh, uh, hours away. And uh, we get to the other side of the island where it's much more remote. And, and that's where Johnny Depp shot the movie Pirates of the Caribbean. So it's very tranquil. It's very much more remote than the other side. And what ended up happening is, is uh, we went and ministered in a church. Uh, we were supposed to go to this other church, but at the last minute, the pastor didn't want us. I mean, it's exactly like Seymour's story. But that lady pastor contacted another pastor by the name of David, who held his church in a casino. <laughs> I'm like, oh, wow, you know. And uh, so we go to this casino to hold these revival meetings. And the glory of God hit that place like a bomb and people are laughing and falling down and weeping. Some are weeping in the altar and real demonstrations of the, of the spirit. Well, the pastor is just weeping as he's interpreting for me. Uh, and in the one part, he pauses me as people are laughing and shrieking and falling out without even touching them. And he's weeping and he's telling the people, this is what I've been preaching about what happened at Azusa Street, exactly meetings just like this. And at the end of that service, an old lady came to us. This old lady came and she was over 100 years old and, and she came up to us crying and she said, I was just a little tiny girl when the first people came uh, from Topeka and from Azusa Street, and and they came to uh, you know came from America with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and she said, "This is what those meetings look like um, when those people came over," <clears throat> and she said it was meetings exactly like this, and she just cried and cried and cried, and she said, "I haven't felt this since I was a young child. This exact same feeling of the glory of God, the power of God moving." with unrestraint and just God, just letting God have his, have, have his way and minister to people. And uh, so it was so powerful. It was just amazing what the Holy Spirit was doing there. And this woman testified it was exactly the same as Azusa Street. Well, in Azusa Street, now you have to understand that I've, in, in our book, in our book, A Fire That Could Jump the Ocean, we talk about all three revivals, the 1901 revival, but then the fire jumped the ocean to Wales in 1904. Then from Wales, then it jumped back to America again to a place called Azusa Street. So you have to understand, so I'm kind of jumping years ahead. So we started in 1901, uh, excuse me, 1900, 1901, and we kind of jumped ahead a few years to 1906. So this is the spring, this is about roughly April, May of 1906. And as this is, is transpiring in the spring of 1906, and God is moving in this little place. Um, one of the things that happened, interesting enough, and I even talk about it in our book, is that it was very interesting how every time uh, a revival has happened, a real dramatic one like this, it's always accompanied by an earthquake. Now, I'm not saying God is you know, destroying buildings and stuff because of revival, but it's almost like the earth itself can't contain the power of God, you know? And that's what happened in 1906. Someone prophesied that there was an earthquake that was coming to California. And sure enough, a little over two weeks after the revival started, the great Northern California earthquake took place. And excuse me, the great San Francisco earthquake. And, and when that took place, that's what we call today the great California fire took place. And so, uh, but... You know, I, I'm saying that just for the sheer purposes. I'm not building a doctrine on it. I'm just saying it's interesting how this happened. Uh, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, what did, what did they say happened? An earthquake. Uh, when Jesus was risen from the dead, what happened? An earthquake. Uh, when, when many different revivals throughout church history took place, what happened? It was an earthquake. What happened in Acts chapter 4 when they prayed? It was an earthquake. Uh, what happened in 1906? It was an earthquake, right? So it's its exact same thing. This outpouring of the power of God. Listen, folks, we got to get back to this. We got to get back to our Pentecostal roots. We've got to get back to the Pentecostal message that we've been given. 
and uh, people like Parham, and excuse me, people like you know William Seymour, who had incredible character, incredible not just gifts, but he had character, and he walked in power and he moved in power, and the glory of God was used and flowed in his ministry. It wasn't just something very carnal. It wasn't just a gifting. It wasn't just a secular thing. It wasn't just miracles. It wasn't just big meetings, but it was just a hosting of God's presence. And they wanted the presence so much. Now listen to this. William Seymour wanted God's presence so much in his life that he went and moved up above the revival meetings. And he literally stayed above those meetings. That's where he moved his residence. And now you have to understand, the, the revival only went on for three and a half years. But in three and a half years, they had literally had millions of visitors from all over the world uh, with nothing more than the printed page. They had a newsletter uh, in the printed page. That's all they had. They didn't have the medium of television and radio and internet and you know all of those different, Facebook, none of those things. They had none of those things. But the fire of God fell in that place called Azusa. And it, and it was amazing how God began to just get poured out with this Pentecostal message. And they said it wasn't uh, a minor thing. It was a major thing with God. And it's awesome how God is restoring this back to the church. Just in 2015, God spoke to me about doing something out of the norm and to start uh, every meeting that we have to start the service off with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and to start the services off that way. I mean, without, you know, I mean, once worship was over and we were introduced, once I took the microphone, boom, if you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, come to the front. And we had hundreds and even thousands baptized in the Holy Spirit in 2015 alone. Thousands all over the world, in every nation, in Norway, in Denmark, we had it in uh, uh, South Africa, we had it in, in, all in Canada, we had it in all kinds of different nations that we were in, and obviously here in America, and in, in other countries too that I'm not remembering right off the top of my head. But I say that for this reason, is that people are hungry for this baptism of the Holy Ghost. And churches are getting away from it. We're, get, we're getting on peripheral things instead of important things. And that's what I loved about Seymour is he stuck with the critical things. The critical things were important. The things God majors in, that's what we should major in. When God minors on something, I always ask preachers, why are you majoring on it if God's not? If God, if the Lord Jesus is modeling for us in the scriptures, something that is not major. Why are you majoring on this? Okay, so, but we see in the book of Acts, we see it as very much a major. Very, very, very much a major. And we've got to get back to this thing again. We've got to get back to getting a hunger, getting a passion, saying, God, I want your fire. I want your baptism of the Holy Ghost. I mean, this is what happened in the 90s again. Uh, with the holy laughter and the joy in Toronto and Rodney Hart Brown and Pensacola and all of these things was a baptism of the Holy Ghost. We got to get back to it again, folks. You got to do it yourselves. I, I can't, us preachers can't do it for you. You've got to carry it just like Parham's people did, just like the people of, of, of Wales did, just like the people of Azusa did. They went and they not only got it for themselves and then went home, yes, but they went and they carried it everywhere. Everywhere they went. They'd say, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? You know, just like Acts 19. And they would go and they would share the gospel like that. They believed it was a part of the gospel. And you know what it is? It's a part of the gospel we've got to get back to. But if we don't hold, you know, emphasis on it, we'll lose this thing. So it's important. If it's important for God, it needs to be important for us. Amen. And so I really want to encourage you to go for this, not only to go for it, but to really begin to start to spread the fire, start to share the fire wherever you go. That's why our website is sharethefire.org is because it's an important part of the kingdom that you and I share the fire. You've got to start sharing the fire, folks. And uh, because you'll never be happy until you really begin to step out and start sharing the fire. Well, this is what uh, Seymour did. They didn't have meetings once a day. Oh, no, no, no. They had three meetings a day, morning 
noon and evening. And Seymour living right above, when he wasn't preaching, you know what he would do? If, they, if he would hear them get out of the Holy Spirit and start to get in the flesh, he had like a cane, like a stick, and he would bang on the floor as hard as he could. And he would just bang that thing as hard as he could on the floor. And he'd say, get back in the spirit. <laughs> Even if he wasn't officiating the meeting or anything, you know, it's so, it's so powerful to see. And we got to get back to this thing globally, folks. Listen, every denomination was impacted in 19, from 1901 all the way to the present through this Pentecostal outpouring of the Spirit. And uh, we've got to get back to it again. We've got to create an importance for it. We've got to create a hunger for it in people. Because if we don't, who's going to do it? You know what I mean? So you've got to do it. I've got to do it. We've all got a part to play. So... I just really pray that these, these messages that I'm sharing really impacts you and stirs your heart uh, for revival. God wants to bring a revival wherever you're watching this. No matter where, if you're watching it on your phone, if you're watching it on your television or your computer screen, wherever you're watching this right now, God, I just pray right now for every person. I just prophesy, Lord, that people that are watching this, that revivals are gonna break out in their home, in their neighborhoods, in their churches, in their small groups or Bible studies or home group meetings or house church meetings, whatever, God, I just pray right now, we need to see the fire out poured again like never before. So God, I just pray fire of God, fill people now. And if somebody's there watching right now, you're watching this and you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, right now I want you to do this. I just want you to just lift your hands right now. Just take your hands like this. And just pray this with me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of the past. Today, I will be filled with the Holy Ghost and speak with other tongues. In the name of Jesus, amen. So right now, put your hand out to, towards mine right now. So Father, right now, as a point of contact, right now in the name of Jesus, somebody that's watching this, wherever they're watching this in the world, I command you be baptized in the Holy Ghost and speak with other tongues. Just lift your hands and just let those heavenly words just roll out of your mouth. Right now, Frada, Dice, Father, fill them right now with the Holy Ghost and power right now. Lord, I pray right now the fire of God would fill them and confusion would leave their minds. Faith would stir their hearts and people would be blessed all over the world. Just keep speaking in your heavenly language today. Write us, email us, tell us what God did. Call us, give us a testimony that you were filled with the Holy Ghost in today's broadcast. We love you guys. Help us, partner with us. Go right to sharethefire.org. Partner with us. Help us impact the nations. We love you.